on Zika virus being used as a treatment for glioblastomas. So let's get into it. So 74.6%. This is the percent of malignant brain tumors that are gliomas and, glio and glioblastomas are a type of glioma. Now, you're probably wondering what glioblastomas are. So glioblastomas are a type of rare malignant brain tumor that rarely metastasize. And this means that the tumors don't go beyond where the original point is. So a hallmark, a hallmark of cancer is that the tumor can travel through the bloodstream and create cancer somewhere else. And glioblastomas don't do this. So the survival after diagnosis is usually less than two years, which is obviously not what we want. And the current treatments are surgery and chemotherapy, and they're not very effective. So something that the researchers looked into was using Zika virus to see if it was more effective and if it could increase the survival rate. So my paper is Zika virus has oncolytic activity against glioblastoma stem cells, or Zika virus kills brain tumor stem cells. Now Zika virus is a flab virus, which means that it's transmitted through insects, and Zika virus is transmitted through mosquitoes. It causes fetal microcephaly in pregnant women, which means that the brain development in the fetus is slowed causing a smaller brain. And the, the Zika virus in adults, the symptoms are usually mild, only being fever, rash, headache, joint pain, red eyes, and muscle pain. And there is no current vaccine for Zika virus right now. So what do you guys think could be a concern about using Zika virus as a brain cancer treatment? Because once it's used as the treatment, there's no cure to get it out of the person. Yeah, that is a concern they have. Does anyone else have any, Avery? Maybe because like it's causing like in in like newborns or like it's causing like the brain to be smaller, so like it could kill like brain cells that you don't want to kill. Yeah. So they had a concern was their concern was once the cells were infected, was it going to slow any development of the brain, and is if was it going to be harmful? to the adults. So the first step they took was exposing human glioblastoma cells to the Zika virus in vitro. So stem cells are undifferentiated blank slate cells, so the cells that haven't been given a job yet in the tumor. And what they saw here, this is the control, and this is treated with the Zika virus. So what they saw was greater than 60% of the glioblastoma stem cells were infected 48 hours after infection. But they didn't know why Zika virus had a preference of these GSCs. So they used SOX2, which is a marker for GSCs, which is the red in this. And then they infected the cells with Zika virus, and they saw that there was a preference for the binding to cells that express SOX2. So they also saw that the Zika virus infected DGCs, which are differentiated glioblastoma cells, but, but at a much lower rate than it infected the stem cells. As seen, the cell number that were infected went to 12 for the GSCs, but didn't go above 1.7 for the DGCs. Yes? Why is that important? It's important because the Zika virus Normally, in a fetus, it just slows the development of a brain. So they thought that there was going to be a target for stem cells because the cells are still developing. And then what they saw in the regular developed cells, they don't know why, but yeah. <laughs> so next, they took a glioblastoma organoid model, which is just a glioblastoma organ model tumor model, sorry. And so this was in vitro, and they exposed two different models to two different strains of Zika. And they, show, they took pictures at two weeks and at four weeks, and as you can see, 
the masses shrunk incredibly. <coughs> Any questions? So knowing that SOX2 is a marker for G GSCs, which are the stem cells, and knowing that this was done in the glioblastoma organoid models, can anyone explain this figure for me? Okay, so this figure is just again showing the Zika virus preference of the GSCs, even in an organoid model. Everyone got that? Okay. So these were just more tests run on the organoid models. So they took three different markers, AC3, which measures activity in apoptosis, KI67, which is a marker of proliferating tumor cells, which just means that these cells were replicating, and GFAP, which is a marker of the differentiated tumor cells. So what they saw was that the Zika virus induced cell death, as seen that the Zika virus binded to the AC3. What, and they also saw that the Zika virus didn't efficiently infect the cells with the KI67 marker or the GFAP marker. So the Zika virus did not infect differentiated tumor cells or the proliferating. So just to clarify, the proliferating tumor cells were mature cells that were just dividing. And yes. They, they weren't stem cells. Yeah. So now these tests were run in actual human glioblastoma specimens. So tumors were resected from patients, and then the researchers got it and ran tests on it. So the tumors were exposed to Zika virus over the course of one week. And the scene here, the this is just the percent of glioblastoma cells that were positive for Zika virus, and this just shows that the one strain was more effective, but yeah. And it also shows that the majority of cells that were infected were markers for SOX2. So again, the stem cells were affected. They also did for KI67 and GFAP, and what was really good about this one was that <coughs> Zika virus did infect the proliferating cells, which means that the for the tumors could be slowed down more. And that was, again, just the the differentiated cells. So the next thing that they did was see the Zika virus effects on just normal adult neural cells, and they saw that the Zika virus did not infect the normal neural cells, which is amazing because does anyone So after they've done all of this in vitro, they wanted to do it in vivo on mouse models. So they use a mouse ad adapted Zika virus because mice aren't natural hosts for Zika virus. So they <coughs> compared the adapted strain to a parental strain and the control. What they saw in these grain boxes was that the adapted strain was much more effective than the control, obviously, or the parental Zika virus strain. So these three are just three different groups of mice that they tested on, and then these two are just showing that the normal neural cells were not infected, as seen by all the levels were the same. So next they wanted to look at the oncolytic effects of Zika virus in vivo. So the mice were randomized into two groups, GL261 and CT2A. So in these two separate groups, they were then separated into two more groups. One was treated with PBS, which is just a control saline solution, or it was treated with the mouse adapted Zika virus for two weeks. So this shows these were the two groups that were treated with the Zika virus. And these pictures were taken after two weeks, so it shows that the masses shrunk significantly over the course of two weeks. One week, sorry. So now that they've done all these tests on how the glioblastomas are infected by Zika virus, they wanted to see if it had any effect on the survival rate. So what they saw was that these were the two separate groups again. One was control, the other was Zika virus. 
And the control groups both died, all of them died by like day 30. But the ones treated with the adapted Zika virus in the first group, they all died by day like 50. But in the second group, they about 40% of them were all living by day 63. So then they took a higher dose of the Zika virus and they saw that about 50% of the mice were still living after day 63. So these were just pictures that they took over the course of the two weeks that the mice were treated. So they saw that the viral RNA from the Zika virus remains localized, which means that the virus did not go beyond the tumor, which is very good. And they also saw extensive cell death by the AC3 stain. So now they wanted to do some enhancements of Zika virus. So what they did was they sensitized the virus to translation inhibition of IFNs, and IFNs are signaling proteins that tell other cells that there's a virus and we need to kill it. But by inhibiting this, uh, the cells are like, let Zika virus do its job in killing the tumor. So they compared the Zika virus E281A, which is the enhanced Zika virus, and the wild type Zika virus. And they saw that the parental strain was more potent in reducing the GSC growth, but it wasn't significant enough that they just abandoned the adapted Zika virus, as shown in the red boxes. Red is the adapted, and then blue is the wild type. So now they did a combined treatment of the adapted Zika virus and the standard chemotherapy treatment for glioblastomas. And they saw that T TMZ, which is the chemotherapy, had limited effects on GSTs alone, but when combined with the adapted Zika virus, it had a much greater efficacy and it was almost more effective than just the parental strain alone as shown in the green boxes. And they also did a stain for the AC3 positive cells. So the cells that were induced with apoptosis by Zika virus, and they saw that the combined treatment was much more effective in inducing apoptosis cell Yes? What's the difference between the grafts in A and B? Are they just different treatment groups? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well. I, mean, I, I know A and B is different, but the groups are... Yeah, so it was the cell viability, so how many cells were infected, and yeah, how many cells were like still living after the treatment, and then the sphere number, which was, again, just like the number of cells that were infected. So, so that was the last thing the researchers did, but they concluded that Zika virus can be used as an effective treatment in combination with therapy for glioblastoma patients, but the safety of the treatment is still a concern, and that's why tests still need to be run on humans. And what's really cool about this field of medicine is that they're also using measles and herpes to try to create glioblastoma treatments, and that's just a picture of John McCain, who was diagnosed with glioblastoma. Uh, any questions? preference of the GSCs is definitely still something that they don't know the mechanism behind, but it was a very localized treatment. It was just injected into the tumor, and that's how they infected the cells. But does that answer your question? Well, I'm sort of thinking, like, how did, how, how did it kill the cells? Yes. Um, I'm sure it probably wasn't in the scope of the paper, but I don't know if they talked about it. 
Uh, I personally don't know that, but I can get back to you later on. Any other questions? Yes. So, do they work, do they have to worry about like an infected patient um, having to be like contagious and spreading disease? They didn't really go into that in the paper because it's still like very preliminary steps in the treatment, but. I'm sure as the progression of the experiments go on, we'll get into that. Yeah? So the drug research for the cancer project two years ago actually did a pretty similar thing. They were injecting polio into the professionals, and that triggered an immune response. Do you know if this also triggers an immune response like that? Um, I don't think it does because they did take out the IMN signaling so that it wouldn't be an immunotherapy drug, but I'll, I can get back to you. How long ago were they doing these tests on the mice? This was, this paper was published about two months ago, and it was actually done at WashU. Um, 